Good morning. And welcome to worship on this last Sunday of September already. Yeah, I know. Fall is officially was officially here at 8.03 p.m. on Thursday evening. And so we are officially into the fall, which is one of my favorite times of the year. Um, I'm not crazy about hot, hot weather, and I'm really not crazy about cold, cold weather. And so if it was fall all year round, I'd be just so happy. But alas, that's not the truth. This is our last Sunday in our Creation and Lament series that we've been doing for the season of creation. And it's also the last Sunday before September 30th, the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. And so this service is kind of a combination of looking at those two issues together. And so I'm going to begin the service today, for those of you here with us, and those of, us, those of you who are joining us on live stream, with a land acknowledgement. In this place, we acknowledge that we live and work and play and worship on Treaty 1 land, in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oja Cree, and Dakota peoples, and in the heart of the Red River Métis Nation. We are also aware that the water which brews our coffee and tea, the water we use in our kitchens and our bathrooms, comes to us from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. We acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and cultures of these people. We acknowledge their stories and their stewardship of the land and water, the plants and animals through the many generations. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its peoples. As we light this candle, we are reminded that we gather in the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer of the earth and all creatures. Praise be to the Holy Trinity. God is sound and life, Creator of the universe, source of all life, whom the angels sing wondrous light of all mysteries, known or unknown to humankind, and life that lives in all. You have given humans the responsibility to care for each other. Indigenous people have historical, spiritual, and personal ties to these lands on which we inhabit. But many of us have failed to recognize the presence of God in these traditions, and their voices have been silenced. We are thankful to Indigenous nations for their continuing care and presence on this earth. We all value the resilience and strength shown through the generations and today. As we light this candle today, let us remember God's call to serve all creation. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. God calls out through all creation. Do we hear God's call? God weeps at our treatment of God's indigenous children. Do we see God's tears? God laments the racism that has led to cultures destroyed. Do we feel God's lament? God grieves creation's loss. Do we grieve with God? We come today to worship the God of all creation. Let us hear God's call. Let us see God's tears. Let us feel God's lament. And let us share God's grief this day so that tomorrow might be different. Our opening hymn this morning is Many and Great, O God, Are Your Works.
Please join me in the prayer of approach and confession. Let us pray. Created one, here we are, a gathering of your people, evidence of creation's unfolding. We come, all shapes and all sizes, all ages and life stages, all ethnicities and cultures. We come on dancing feet or carefully walking. We come hesitant and unsure, or filled with conviction and knowing our way. Here, however we come, we are here to join with all of creation in praise and thanksgiving. Yet, we don't always care for your world or for each other. In gracious love, you, O oh God, created the world and said it was good, and made everyone equally in your image, every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against you. We hide from you, our Creator. Ignoring your commandments, we violate your image in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We don't always deserve your grace, and yet you are always there for us, calling us to see you in all creation. We pray that our selfish ways shall cease, and all creation shall live in abundance. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Know that the ground of all being, from which all beauty, creation, and wisdom arise, is the ground of your being. Let your fears and anxious worries cease. Turn and see the beauty and goodness from which you are formed, knowing that just to be is a gift. And as we are gifted with that knowledge, let us bring that gift and knowledge to others each and every day. For thus says the Lord of 
hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Our second reading this morning is Luke 16, verses 19 to 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner with evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, then, Father, I beg you to send them to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. I was thinking about the service today and about this time for all ages. A question came to my mind. How many of you remember in school learning anything about residential schools? Residential schools. thinking about the idea that history is written by the victor. And what does that mean? That means the people who have power, the people who win, are the ones who get to write the history of what happened. And here, for us, for me, what that translated to is going through all of my schooling without hearing anything about Indian residential schools, the system, why they were set up, and what they perpetrated in this country. What does it mean when we talk about history being written by the victors? What does that mean that we have missed, that we might not have learned about as we grow or as we grew up. I think that's one of the challenges that we face as we move towards this coming Friday, September 30th, National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, is that many of us grew up not knowing what this is about, not knowing why this day might be important. And in not knowing about this day, it's hard for us to see beyond this day to how our history has impacted our current society. As I said at the beginning, we're talking about creation and lament. That has been our theme for the month of September in the season of creation. 
And today we're also going to bring into this the idea of the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. And so this is the last video of this series, and it is a short little video that was on CBC that was created for CBC. Um, and I think it gives it gave me a really interesting perspective, and I hope that it gives you an interesting perspective on how we might move forward or think about moving forward together from this space going forward. I was six years old when they took me to my residential school. I remember the day walking toward that school with my mother, and it was a silent walk, and I was so afraid. 20 or 30 little kids herded into the showers, and then their body being painted in white liquid of some kind, your hair cropped and then doused in the kerosene, and that was pretty traumatizing. The school held roughly 220 people, half boys, half girls, and we were segregated. If I was caught waiting at my uh, sister, it would be a punishment for me. And, and so, as a result of that segregation, I never really learned any social skills that young people should be learning as they grow up. From a religious and spiritual perspective, of course, the church has lobbied hard to convert indigenous people, Aboriginal people. They said that we were heathen and pagan. They targeted language in those things we had learned through all of millennia to know where we came from, to know who we were, as something that had to be eliminated. Before that time, I lived in a place called Oyasus. They call it Guilford Island now. We harvested from the forest all of the animals that we needed to provide us sustenance. And from the ocean in front of us as well, all of the species of whales and mink and fish. And I had a connection to the environment around us. And so after having spent years in those schools, by the time we were ready to leave, most of us were truly broken. Many of us, including myself, descended into addictions, alcoholism, violence, and it was pretty pretty uh, difficult. Those schools lasted for over a hundred years. There were over 150,000 little children. And the last school that closed in Canada was in 1996 in uh, Saskatchewan. There was a history on this land that had been absolutely ignored. Nobody knew about the residential school legacy. Nobody knew about the intent of the Indian Act, the prominent challenges not facing Aboriginals. And we're starting to uh, accept the idea that we have the shared history for which we all are responsible for. When the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report was uh, submitted, I was in the room when Justin Burry Center, the chair of the commission, denounced Canada. He had just recited a litany of intensive harms against Aboriginal people. And, and when he said, Canada, you have committed cultural genocide, there was just a silence in that room, and then all of a sudden it erupted in euphoria. And you said, survivors want an apology from the Prime Minister in the House of Commons. And I was there and I heard the words, I'm sorry, and then I couldn't see because my eyes were just flowing with tears. I was so happy that somebody had said, I'm sorry. Canada, by the way, is the only Western country that has had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So we're trying to look through a new lens. We as Canadians, we as an Aboriginal, we celebrate with each other, everybody cheering each other up as we move toward a more equal, prosperous future for all of us. My name is Chief Robert Joseph, and I believe that Truth and Reconciliation is Canada.
things that I've heard that I think a lot of us might struggle with is this idea that we are all treaty people. And what does that mean? Because the reality is that the treaties that were signed were signed between the First Nations and the Crown. The representatives of the First Nations who represented all of the indigenous people that lived on these lands and the Crown who represented all of the settler people who had come. Those people are our ancestors. And so the reality is that we are all treaty people. We are all a part of those treaties that were signed. And that is our responsibility to live into what those mean today. said at the beginning of the service, this is our last Sunday in the season of creation. We have looked throughout this season at this idea of lament in creation. We've seen how quite often we will look at the world through those rose-colored glasses so that we don't have to face the, the struggles and challenges that the world presents. We only like to see the 
the beautiful, nice pictures of creation and not those struggling places. We've looked at this idea of what it means to grieve and lament. And we looked at how the world is so interconnected, how we have forgotten this interconnectedness that exists in all that has been created. Last week we spoke about the idea of our personal grief and how that might just be something that can open us up so that we can see grief in others and grief in the world. And how in doing so we might just be able to move forward in our own grief into a new way of being. Today we speak of a lament that is deeply held by many in this world and is overlooked by many others. In recognizing this lament, we might just come to a new way of connecting with an entire community and with all of creation. Our readings today once again find us in Jeremiah. Jeremiah. He has been speaking to the people of Jerusalem and Judea about the coming judgment. In our previous weeks, we heard Jeremiah speak about how the people were not hearing God's call to them, and they were not living into the covenant that God had made with their ancestors. And as such, Jeremiah was seen by the people of Jerusalem and Judea to be a doomsayer. Someone who is preaching this oncoming punishment and judgment of the entire community. Today, though, we find ourselves faced with a little bit of a different Jeremiah. Today, we find a Jeremiah as Frank Yamada, the director of Center for Asian American Ministries at McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago, says, Speaking of this chapter, he says, Chapter 32 contain, contains an audacious prophetic sign of future restoration. Though Jeremiah has been speaking words of judgment against Jerusalem and Judea throughout most of his prophetic career, chapters 30 to 33, also known as the Book of Comfort or the Book of Consolation, contains within messages of hope. So even though Babylon is threatening its complete destruction of Judea, the prophet makes a bold pronouncement about Judea's future, one in which houses and fields and vineyards shall once again be bought in this land. The passage we heard this morning, Jeremiah purchases a piece of land indicate for all who are there that he believes that there will come a time of future justice and hope for all people. Jeremiah does this in the midst of the final downfall of Jerusalem. And so for Jeremiah, this is not about stopping it. This is not about stopping the downfall the oncoming fall of Jerusalem, but rather it is to indicate that in the midst of these times, there was still a future of hope and true justice to look forward to. What does this have to do with the video we watched today? And what does this have to do with the season of creation? Many of our ancestors came to this land as settler people. They came thinking that they knew a better way. They came to a land where the people who were here already lived in harmony with respect for all of creation. They came, and in the midst of their arrival, they found a culture that was rich and full. But they thought it was heathen and pagan in their eyes. They came to find cultures that were foreign and misunderstood to, to themselves, and so these cultures were devalued as not important, and that is the legacy that in many ways we continue to live into this day. Today, 
We are remembering Orange Shirt Day, also known as the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, which is Friday, September 30th. And it is a day when we are called to recognize the legacy of the residential school system here in Canada. And it is a day when we are called to take an honest account of what we have done as settler people to the indigenous people of this land. The video that we watched, I think, makes some really challenging points for us to consider today. The video speaks to the fact that the First Nations people of this land lived off the land. They understood their connectedness to the land, and they lived as one with the land. The original treaties that were signed were signed so that the settler people of this land would have access to use the land to the depth of a plow. The depth of a plow. So that they could feed themselves and provide for themselves. And yet the reality of life is that we have not really honored those trees with the mining and the drilling, we have broken those trees. With the formation of the residential schools to strip entire generations of their culture, their heritage, and their language, have we honored the trees that say that we are to live together on this land? I think when Jeremiah was proclaiming judgment, to the people of Judea and Jerusalem for not living into the covenants that their ancestors had made with God, for not living into who God had called them to be. Think that in many ways we might just be like those to whom Jeremiah was speaking. Because in reality, in some ways, we have not lived into truly being God's people in the world. And in many ways, with the ongoing systematic and institutionalized racism in this country, we have not been people of true justice in our own world. We have been, in many ways, like those of Jerusalem who have not cared for those among us. We have been those who have not recognized the importance and the interconnectedness of God's creation. I wonder if in many ways we might be just like those to whom Jeremiah is proclaiming judgment. But I have a question. What might a time of true justice look like in our world now? What would happen if we looked to those whom, in many ways, we have oppressed, just as Jeremiah was oppressed and lived into that future hope of a time of peace and justice? How might we find signs of hope in our world today? When we look to our indigenous brothers and sisters, we see a resurgence of those who are reclaiming their, care, their culture, their heritage, and their language. When we look to our indigenous brothers and sisters, we see people like Autumn Pelche, the young climate change activist and water activist from Manitoulin Island, who are calling us to task, calling us to live with respect to all creation. When we look to those who continue to highlight the struggle embodied in the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls movement, and yet continue to hope for a new future, a new way where the lives of indigenous women can be safe, can we see signs of hope 
in the midst of judgment. We as Christians should be waking up to these signs of hope and working towards amplifying those voices we have found where we have found hope in the midst of what has been brought down upon them. The reading today, Jeremiah was calling out hope in the midst of the destruction of Jerusalem and Judea. We need to hear the hope in the voices of our indigenous brothers and sisters who are still calling for truth and reconciliation. The voices who are calling for us to respect all of creation and all of the creatures of creation. The voices who are calling for justice for all persons regardless of skin color, culture, ethnicity, gender, orientation. On this, our last Sunday of creation. On this, the Sunday before the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. We have spent three weeks looking at lament and grief, looking at Jeremiah calling for judgment. So today, let us look for those places and signs of hope within this world. Let us look to those who are calling for justice for both the climate and for our indigenous brothers and sisters, for all people. And in doing so, find that hope that Jeremiah embodied when in the midst of the destruction, he purchased a piece of land. Let us find hope for a new future together, where all of us, where all of creation can live in peace, in justice, and love.
come together as a community of faith, bringing all that we are to this place, to this community, and the work that we do. Our offerings consist of our time, our talent, and our treasure. But our offering now be received. Give us the courage to sow seeds and plant trees for generations yet to come. Help us to celebrate the joy of every kind of birth as miracle and promise. I invite you to look forward to the South. O Spirit of the South, thanks be to you for the warm winds of summer nurturing growth. Fill us with a youthful vibrancy and optimism that we may sustain hope for a loving relationship with Earth and all her creatures. Keep us in solidarity with peoples and places of the global south, especially places and particular struggles we name at this time. And those whom we pray feel your nurturing presence in their lives today as we lift up from this community. Marlene, Liam, Rob, Betty, Liam, Bernice, Paul, Heather, Barb, Wayne, Merv, Blanche and family. We also lift up the Blakey family on the passing of Bill Blakey yesterday. We continue to offer prayers for Ukraine as those people continue to fight for their freedom. We continue to offer prayers for Pakistan dealing with unprecedented flooding. We pray for Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and the Turk and Caicos Islands as they look at the damage that has been wrought by Hurricane Fiona. We pray for Atlantic Canada, those who are still without power and expect to be without power for the next number of days as they too recover from Hurricane Fiona and the damage that she has wrought. Set our hearts afire for an individual and collective justice, we pray. I invite you to face the West. Spirit of the West, for your many huge sunsets and life-giving rain clouds, we give you thanks. Grant us the steady hand of adulthood. Nurture us for the journeys we face from day to day and bless the place that we call home. Help us to care for the sick, the frail, and those in special need. May our care and concern work together for human healing and the mending of a broken world. I invite you to face forward again. Spirit of the North, home of the winter winds and the season of dark anticipation, we thank you for the majesty of polar bears and snowy owls, of dancing northern lights, and of the fish and seals that sustain life there. Fill us with the wisdom of elders that we may know when and how to speak for the sake of Earth and all of her inhabitants. Comfort the elderly who are bereaved and struggling. 
take away our fear of death, and, in, and that in returning to earth we may also see the promise of resurrection. I now invite you to say with me the prayer that Jesus taught us, but brought to us once again by Maori theologians. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echoes through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world, your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your beloved community of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In the times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory and the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to join in singing our closing hymn, Deep in Our Hearts. creation, who marveled at the lilies of the field, who transforms chaos to order, lead us to transform our lives and the church, to listen to the voices of all creatures that reflect God's glory in creation. And as you go in to this week, know that the God of creation goes with you each and every step of the way. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> ¶¶